Oh, you believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Ramadan, it is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show, Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we are discussing the topic, Ramadan, the month of the Quran, part two. Dr. Zakia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Part two of the program, such a an informative and wonderful session we had last time out. We've got so many questions, we decided let's go for a second run. Alhamdulillah. First question I'd like to pose to you today. Can you inform the viewers about any particular ayahs, verses or surahs of the Quran which will be beneficial for them to recite during the holy month of Ramadan? There are many verses, in fact, the whole of the Quran. You recite any verse and you shall get some up. But there are a few verses and some surahs that have been pointed out by beloved Prophet Muhammad in which there are more benefits. For example, it's mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number two, in the Book of Salah, hadith number 1769, where the beloved Prophet said that, is there any of you who cannot recite one third of the Quran in the night. So the Sahaba said, how is it possible to recite one third of the Quran in one night? So the Prophet said, read Qul Huallahu Ahd, that is Surah Class, chapter number 112, for it is one third of the Quran. So if you recite Surah Class, chapter number 112, verses one to four, which has only four verses, it is as though you have recited one third of the Quran. It's further mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, Volume number three, page number 437, which is also classified as Sahih by Sheikh Almani in his Silsila as Sayyah, hadith number 589, where our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who recites Surah Class 10 times, he builds for himself a house in the paradise. If anyone who recites Surah Class 10 times, he gets a house in paradise. It's further mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 2058, which says that the two surahs, Surah Falak and Surah Nas, they were revealed which will protect you from evil and it's a cure. That means the Muazzatain, the last two surahs of the Quran, chapter number 113, that is Surah Falak, and chapter number 114, Surah Nas, they were revealed to protect a person from evil, and it's called as the cure. It's further mentioned in the Sai Hadith of Tabrani, volume number 8, in the book of Virtues of the Quran, Hadith number 7532, which is also mentioned in Silsala as Sayyah, Hadith number 972, where it's mentioned that anyone who recites the Ayat al-Kursi after all the compulsory salah, he will not be forbidden entrance in paradise. Because if you recite the Ayat al-Kursi, Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 255, after all your obligatory salah, all the five compulsory salah, then inshallah you will not be forbidden, you will not be prohibited from entering Jannah. And it's further mentioned 
in Mustadrak al Hakim, hadith number 2072, that anyone recites Surah Kahaf on Friday, he will get a light which will remain with him till next Friday. There are many such hadith in which the Prophet has mentioned certain verses which have got superiority. I'll just mention one more. The beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number two, in the Book of Salah, hadith number 1757, that if you recite the two surahs, Surah Baqarah and Surah Al Imran, you will have two clouds or two canopies or two flocks of birds who will intercede for you on the day of resurrection. These are just some of the verses and surahs which the Prophet has mentioned the benefits and the virtues. In order to maximize the benefits uh, during this holy month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, that's excellent, thank you. Now it's a certain fact, an unfortunate certain fact, there are many Muslims who have a very superficial respect for the Qur'an in terms of touching it, placing it in the right place, etc., covering it. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to actually adhering to the principles of the Qur'an and implementation of those principles, there seems to be a lacking. Tell me, which is more important, the undue care and love and attention to the Qur'an or the implementation of the virtues of the Qur'an? As far as giving respect to the Qur'an, meaning the outward respect, is that more important or reading and understanding and implementing on the guidance is important? Both are important. A Muslim should respect the Qur'an as much as he can. At the same time, we should read the understanding and implement on the message which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. But unfortunately, there are some Muslims who only give outward respect. That means superficially, you see the respect, but they don't implement on the guidance for which the Qur'an was revealed. So defeat is the very purpose. For example, many Muslims, they keep the Qur'an on top of the shelf. It is the topmost book. And they keep it so much on top that it catches dust. And if a person has to read the Qur'an, he'll think ten times, you know, that, oh, it's so high. You know, it's difficult to reach. The Qur'an should be a book which is a guide for your day-to-day -day life. It should be kept handy, like a guide, a textbook which is referred daily. It's kept at a shelf which is easy for approach so that you can have it at any opportunity that you require it. That is the way we should treat the Qur'an as a guide for our life every day. Furthermore, some people, they tie the Qur'an securely in a silk cloth and keep it on top. And if a person has a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes time, he would not bother reading the Qur'an. The thought of him getting the Qur'an down and untying it and again tying it securely in the silk cloth, that itself will take 10-15 minutes. So he says, what is the use of spending the time reading the Qur'an? So it should be handy and whenever a person feels he should be able to approach it. Many of the Muslims, they have a thousand questions before they touch the Qur'an. As though the Qur'an is an RDX bomb, it's going to explode. There are a thousand questions that, are you in wudu? Is it alright? Can I touch the Qur'an? You know, can I read the Qur'an while standing? Can I read while traveling? Having the shoes and reading the Qur'an, it is haram. Where did they get this from that, which hadith or which Qur'anic verse says that you can't read the Qur'an with the shoes on? It defeats the very purpose. It should be a daily guide for the Muslims. And it should be handy. And at every opportunity that you have, you should read the Qur'an. And we find this very often. If you go to the mosque in the Gulf countries, that if a person who comes to pray to the mosque, if he has a few minutes, he doesn't waste time. He picks up the copy of the Qur'an and he reads. And we find that most of the people that come early, they read the Qur'an. But in the mosque in the subcontinent, that's India and Pakistan, you may see a few people reading the Qur'an, maybe in the first row. And if someone in the second row reads the Qur'an, they will immediately stop him. The back, your back is facing the Qur'an, it is haram. So these things were superficial respect, outward respect. It's not really what the Qur'an has been revealed for. It is revealed as a guidance for humankind. You should read it whenever you have an opportunity. And that reminds me of an incident that in the Gulf country, once an Indian Kari, he had gone to Saudi Arabia to visit the country. And because he was a very good Kari, they allowed him to lead the Maghrib Salah. 
So the Qari recited in the Salah, Surah Fatiha, then Surah Yusuf, and with a very good voice, melodious voice, with Tajweed, Alhamdulillah. After he finished the Salah, there was an Arab who was smiling. So the Indian Qari, he asked him, that why? Didn't you like my Kharat? So he said, no, your Kharat was wonderful. But I was wondering that in the Salah, you put Yusuf salam inside the well, but why didn't you get him out before the Salah was over? <laughs> the joke is that he read the Quran, Surah Yusuf, but didn't understand what he was reading. So he put Yusuf salam in the well, but before the Salah, at least we have brought him out of the well. So it's very important that besides giving respect, which is important, you should give respect. But the main thing is read the Quran with understanding and implement its guidance in your life daily. That's the best. Definitely. That's a wonderful advice there. Thank you very much, Doctor. Dr. Zakir, though it is true that Islam is a universal religion, religion of mankind, many Muslims, it seems, and non-Muslims, consider that the Quran is a message only for the Muslims. Can you just clarify, is it only just for the Muslims? Many people do have a misunderstanding, as you rightly mentioned. Many Muslims, as well as non-Muslims, have a misunderstanding that the Quran was revealed only for the Muslims. In fact, nowhere does the Quran say that it was revealed only for the Muslims. In fact, the Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1, Alif, Lam, Ra. This is a book which was given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that thou may leadest the mankind from darkness to light. It doesn't say that this book will only lead the Muslims from darkness to light, but lead the humankind from darkness to light. It's further mentioned in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52. Here is a message for mankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is only one God. Let the men of understanding take heed. It says here is a message for humankind, not only for the Muslims or the Arabs. And it's further mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 185. Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance for humankind. Clear signs of guidance and judgment. Criteria to judge right from wrong. And it's further mentioned in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that we have revealed the Quran, we have given the Quran to thee, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, so that thou may instruct the humankind. It doesn't say that thou may instruct only the Muslims or the Arabs, but the whole of humankind. And Prophet Muhammad was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs. The Quran says in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, illa rahmatil alameen, that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind, as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures. A similar message repeated in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28. We have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings they did not know. So the Quran, the last and final revelation, and the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, they were sent for the whole of humankind. Well, I'm glad you've confirmed that now. Now it's out on record. Everybody has a chance. And they have no excuse. Absolutely. Let's put it to bed now. Alhamdulillah. Which of the English translations or meanings of the Arabic uh, Quran would you recommend to the viewers as being the best? There are many English translations of the Quran. As I mentioned, Quran has been translated in most of the major languages of the world. As far as English is concerned, in our foundation, Islamic Research Foundation, we have more than 50 different translations of the Quran only in English language. The best overall amongst all the English translations, there are a few. One of them is the Sai International. This is the copy. The Sai International. It is translated just a few years ago. It was translated by three American ladies. These three accepted Islam. And Alhamdulillah, they have referred to various previous translations. And this is authentic translation. 
But one thing I would like to mention that no translation of the Quran is exactly as the original word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the translation is a human handiwork. So no translation would be free from errors. No translation. It can come closer to the meaning of the Quran, but because the translation is the work of a human being, it can come no way exactly the same as the Arabic Quran. But amongst the ones that we have in English language, Sai International is one of the good ones. The translation is authentic, alhamdulillah. But naturally, as I mentioned, that there's bound to be a few errors. The other one, which is overall good, and which I recommend, is the translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali spent more than 40 years only in translating the Quran. And overall, I say that if you want to give to a non-Muslim, the translation overall is good. It has commentary. It has got footnotes. And the English is a bit archaic. You know, the old English. The, thou, ye, which most of the people don't like, but actually it's closer to Arabic. Because Arabic is a language in which you have two genders, male and female. And numbers, you have three. Singular, dual, and plural. So in English language, if I have to say you, whether it's a male or a female, I use you. Whether it's a single person or two persons or more than two, I use the same you. For six different people, whether single, dual or plural, whether male or female, I use the same you. But in Arabic, for a male single person, is a different you, anta. For a female single person, it's anti. Similarly, dual, for male, female is separate. Plural, more than two, male, female is separate. That's six different yous. So in this archaic, English, instead of you, they have e, the, thou, which is closer to the Arabic, but it's difficult for those who aren't used to this English. It's difficult. But there are people who have simplified this English of the likes of Ali, and they've taken out this e and thou and made it into you, etc. But overall, this translation is very good, but again, it has some errors, which are cross errors. You should be aware of it. These errors are cross. But barring these errors, which are there, as I mentioned that, this is one of the old translations. And it is one of the most popular translations. There have been tens or maybe hundreds of millions of copies of Abdul Yusuf Ali, which has been distributed throughout the world. Because it's a popular translation, there are books written against this Quran also maximum. But Alhamdulillah, it is a good handiwork. We have to be careful of the errors. The other good translation is the Noble Quran by Taqiyuddin Hilali and Mohsen Khan. This translation I especially recommend for the Muslims. I don't recommend for the non-Muslims because it has too many brackets. And it's good for the Muslims because in the footnotes, very often, they give references from Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. So it's helpful for the Muslim to understand the Quran better. But for non-Muslim, because of the brackets and too many explanations, it may not be very much feasible for Dawah work, according to me. The other translation which is good is by Abdul Majid Daryabadi. It's in four volumes. Its main speciality is it's good for comparative religion. And it gives quotation from the Bible and the other scriptures besides the Islamic scriptures. Another English translation which is good is by Muhammad Asad. It is a very logical translation. He very often quotes Zamakshari as Kashaf. But if you be careful, sometimes he goes overboard. He tries to prove everything logically, even the miracles, etc. So have to be careful. Otherwise, its argument is very sound. We have to be careful. As I said, no translation is free from error. Then the other translation that you have is by Mahmoud Kutthal, you know, the Britisher. But it's only translation, there's no commentary, there's no footnotes. You have the translation of T.B. Irving, which is an American translation. If an American English, that's a good translation, T.B. Irving. If you want a poetic translation, then Arthur Arbery is there. He's a non-Muslim, but it's a poetic translation. These are many of the translations which were translated directly from Arabic to English, and the famous one. There are many other, several. There are some translations which have been translated from Arabic to another language, Urdu, and then to English. For example, by Maulana Abul Allah Maududi. And that's called as Tafim al Quran. 
that's a good translation. It's in six volumes. The new one is in more volumes, and especially the new translation from Urdu to English by Zafar Ishaq Ansari is far better in English. And it's a different view. You know, it gives a different view, a different angle of the Quran. I'd like to mention one more. The other one which translated from Arabic to Urdu to English is by Maulana Shams Pirzada. It's in three volumes, Dawud al-Quran. So these are some of the important translations. I think it's approximately 10 that I've mentioned. There are more than 50 that are available and in the market maybe more. Just a sample for the viewers if they want, they can refer to this translation. SubhanAllah. And we've had a book review as well in this show. That's excellent. What suggestions, Dr. Zakir, can you give to the viewers in order to help them read the Qur'an with understanding? The arguments I gave earlier, that's sufficient to prove to a viewer that he should read the Qur'an with understanding. But normally when you read the Qur'an, there are two types of reading. One is tazakkur quran one is tadabbur quran tazakkur quran is superficial reading of the Qur'an, which can be easily done by reading the translation of any Qur'an, whether it's in Arabic or any translation. Other is tadabbur quran pondering over the meaning of the Qur'an, as Allah says in the Qur'an in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 82. Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an. Walau qana min indi gairillah. Lawajudu fiqtilaf in kaseero. Do they not consider the Qur'an with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. So here the Qur'an says, Afala yatadabbaroon al-Qur'an. Do they not ponder over the meaning of the Qur'an? So one is tazakur al-Qur'an, that is superficial reading of the Qur'an, which you can take any translation of the Qur'an and read and understand the concept of the Qur'an. But one is tadabbur quran which if you read the translation of the Qur'an, you can do only to a certain level. Knowing Arabic is important for doing in-depth pondering over the Qur'an. A person can say that I have done 100% tazakur quran I have read the Qur'an, he fine, he can say it. But no one can say I have pondered over the complete meaning of the Qur'an. No one can say that. Because the Qur'an is a book. As many times as you read, you'll never get tired. Any other normal book, if it's a good book, you may like reading it maybe twice, maybe thrice, maybe four, five, ten, not more than that. But Quran, even if you read a thousand times, if you read it the thousand and first time, yet you'll get knowledge. It's an ocean of knowledge. You get different views, different angles, and you try and understand it better. This copy of the Quran should be in the house of every Muslim. If he doesn't understand Arabic as a language, he should have the translation of the copy of the Qur'an in the language he understands the best. If he understands English, he should have the English translation of the Qur'an. If he understands French, he should have French translation of the Qur'an. If he understands German, he should have German translation. If he understands Urdu, Urdu translation. The language he understands the best, every Muslim home should have the translation of the Qur'an in that language. This book, the Glorious Qur'an, is the best gift you can give to anyone, whether it be your friends, whether it be your relatives, whether it's a gift for marriage, whether it's a gift you're going to meet someone, whether it's a housewarming ceremony, it's the best gift you can give. It's the best gift even to a non-Muslim. You can give the copy of the Quran to a non-Muslim as the best gift. And it will be a guide for his life. The best gift that a parent can give to his child is the copy of the Quran. Not only give that, you should make him understand that. And it's very important that if the parents can see to it that they teach their children Arabic language so that they can understand the Quran directly, it is the best gift they can give to the children. Our parents didn't think it important that we should learn Arabic as a language. That is the reason we are here today. Otherwise, you know, to learn Arabic as a language is very important. And for that purpose, Alhamdulillah, we opened a school, Islamic International School, where we teach Arabic to the children from the age of three. We teach English and Arabic. And we teach A for Apple, B for Bolo, A for Allah, B for Bismillah. Along with that, we teach Min Alif Asadun, Min Ma Baitun, Min Tatu Fahun. So they learn Arabic and English together. And Alhamdulillah, by the time they reach third, fourth, fifth standard, Alhamdulillah, they can understand Quran directly. They learn Lugha Fusa. And all my three children, I have a son who's about 12 and a half years old, a daughter 10 and a half years old, and another daughter about eight years old. Alhamdulillah, all can speak and you read or recite any Quranic verse, Alhamdulillah, and 
they can immediately translate the Quran across, alhamdulillah. And my son, he has almost completed the Quran, alhamdulillah. And his Qarat is better, much better in the position that we are. So the best gift a parent can give to the child is the Quran. And we teach him Arabic as a language, so that you can understand the last and final guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And we should make it a practice in the offices that whenever our employee, when they come to the office, they should say the Quran. In all our foundation, in Islam Christian Foundation, in our school, it's compulsory that all the employees, the moment they come in, first they have to swipe the time chip card, so the attendance is taken. Immediately, they have to read at least 15 minutes the Quran along with the translation. People may think, you know, we have a few hundred employees. Few hundred employees, every day, 15 minutes, a loss of thousands of dollars. But actually, it's a benefit. Whether it's a business, whether it's an organization, your staff learns to be honest. And it's preferable, it's better, he will give better output. Alhamdulillah. All the Muslims should see to it that at the workplace, they should make it compulsory. In the family, we should see to it that we read the Quran daily, whether it be after Fajr Salah, whether it be after Risha, whichever is convenient time, the family, the father, the mother, the children get together, and one of them can recite the Quran and one can read the translation, so that it's a family reading of the Quran. This way, it will encourage all of them to understand the Quran better and come closer to the Quran, and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will increase, alhamdulillah, and we will come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. Well, we'll now move on to the second part of the show, which is to answer the question of the viewers. Relating to the topic, Ramadan, the month of the Quran. Of course, this is part two. So, Dr. Zakir, the first question from our viewers is, what about those people who are not fluent in reciting the Quran in Arabic and struggle to recite the Quran as it should be recited with all the tajweed and uh, makhraj, etc. Could you give some advice to that person? As far as the person who struggles to recite the Quran and doesn't have proper tajweed and he has difficulties, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned to say Muslim, volume number one in the Book of Salah, hadith number 1745, the beloved Prophet said, that anyone who recites the Quran fluently, proper tajweed, etc., the angels, they'll be with him. But a person who falters and struggles to recite the Quran, he will get double reward. And the explanation is given that one, for reciting the Quran, and second, for struggling. So a person who cannot recite the Quran correctly, and yet he continues and struggles and reads, inshallah, he'll get double reward. So this is Islam, mashallah. But the more he struggles, the more reward he'll get, inshallah. Inshallah. The next question, some Muslims are continuously engaged in reciting the Quran in the month of Ramadan and they do khatm uh, al-Quran, they complete the Quran many times. How many times is a Muslim supposed to, you know, finish the Quran? Reading as much as the Quran, especially in the month of Ramadan, is good, alhamdulillah. The Prophet has recommended. But each thing has its limitation. Doing more is good, but you can't do excess. And the hadith of a beloved Prophet in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 6, hadith number 5054, where the beloved Prophet wasallam said that when a person asks one of the sahabas that how much Quran should I read? So the Prophet said that read the Quran once in a month. So the Sahaba said, I can do much more than that. So the Prophet replied that read the Quran once in seven days. And that was a common practice among the Sahabas that they used to read the Quran once every seven days. And that is the reason the Quran is divided into seven manzils. You know, each manzil is a little bit more than four jews, four parts. And the Quran also has been divided into 30 parts. So if you recite one part, one juz, every day, in one month you can complete the Quran. That's what is normally recommended. If you can do better, then every week if you complete the Quran, that's Alhamdulillah. 
but the Prophet also warned. It's mentioned in Tirmidhi, in the Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 2949, that the Prophet said that anyone who completes the Quran in less than three days, he has not understood the Quran. That means if you complete the Quran less than three days, if you read so fast, then you will not understand the Quran. It's just like, you know, as you said, like a parrot fashion, very fast, very fast, it's useless. Even though you understand Arabic, you won't be able to understand the Quran reading so fast. So it's important that when you read the Quran, you should understand the Quran. So this hadith, again of Tirmidhi, hadith number 2949, which says that if you have read the Quran in less than three days, it is as though you have not read the Quran. Besides mentioning the time span, that it should be three days or more, can't be less than that. It also gives another indication that only reading is not sufficient, understanding is also important. So therefore, I always recommend that besides reading in Arabic, also read the translation. Instead of doing Khatmi Quran twice in the month of Ramadan, read once in Arabic and once in the translation, if you don't understand Arabic. Instead of doing four times, read twice in Arabic and twice the translation in the language you understand the best. So at least besides reading, you're understanding what our Creator has asked us to do and you can implement the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the best is that, as the Prophet said that, if you want to read the maximum, it should be, I mean, the minimum time period required is three days. So you cannot complete more than 10 times the Quran in the whole month of Ramadan. But the normal practice was in seven days, they used to complete the Quran once, so it's about a little bit more than four times, or once at least in the month, it's preferable. Hope that's the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakir, for that. We've got another question here from one of our viewers. Uh, question is, which is the best Arabic tafsir of the Qur'an available that has been translated into English? As far as Arabic tafsirs are concerned, there are many tafsirs in Arabic. The two most well-known amongst all the Arabic tafsirs is of Tabri and the other is Ibn Qasir. There are many other tafsirs, for example, Qurtubi, then Zamak Shadi Kashaf, and various others. But the two most famous are Tabri and Ibn Qasir. Only Ibn Qasir has been translated into English by many other publishers, including Darul Salam from Riyadh. The name of the commentator of the Quran, Tabri, the full name is Imam Muhammad Ibn Jarir at Tabri. And he was born in 224 AH after Hijri and died in 310 AH after Hijri at the age of 86. And according to Ibn Khuzayma, he says that he has read the book from the start to the end. And he does not know of any person more knowledgeable than Ibn Jarir in the full world as far as knowledge of the Quran is concerned. There are many comments by many various scholars on the commentary of a tabri Another famous person, Sheikh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, regarding this commentary, he says that amongst the commentaries available now, at his time he's talking, amongst the commentaries available at his time, the best commentary is of Ibn Jarir, at tabri Because he gives the views of the Salafs, of the predecessors, the Salaf is solid. And he also quotes from authentic Sanad. The Sanad is authentic. He does not quote sources which are dubious, which are doubtful. Neither does he quote Bidah, that is innovation. That is the reason Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah preferred his commentary the best. And in another book he has given his comments, again, Sheikh Al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, that Tabri, he quotes from the Sahabas, from the Tabains, and the Tabi Tabains, that the followers of the Tabain. And he even gives the exact Sanat, mentioning each name. So those who are scholars, it's good for them, they can go back and check each Ravi, each narrator, and check his authenticity. Which may not be useful for a layman, common man, like you and me. You know, he says, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, that a common man is only interested in knowing whether the hadith is sahi or zaif or maudu. He may not be interested in the sanad. 
So therefore, this commentary is very good for the scholars and the seekers of knowledge. The other Arabic tafsir, which is very good and very famous, it is Ibn Qasir. And the name of the commentator of this tafsir, the full name is Abul Fida Ismail Ibn Qasir al Tamakshi. His commentary, according to Siyuti, he says there has not been a commentary written similar to Ibn Qasir's commentary. And if you read Ibn Qasir's commentary, he gives cross references and he quotes other verses of the Quran. He gives the commentary of the Quran from the Quran itself. He quotes the other hadith, say hadith, and many a time he even gives the sanad, especially if it's a Musnad Ahmad because he was a person who had memorized the full of Musnad Ahmad. So it becomes helpful for a person to check whether it's right or wrong. So Ibn Qasir itself, mashallah, its commentary is very good. So these two commentaries, At-Tabri and Ibn Qasir, are the best. In short, as far as these two best commentaries are concerned, At-Tabri is more famous and better, but especially for the scholars and the seekers of knowledge. It may not be good for a layman or ordinary person, but as far as Ibn Qasir is concerned, it's good for the scholar as well as the seeker of knowledge, as well as for ordinary Muslim. These two communities in Arabic are the two best on a point to my knowledge, alhamdulillah, and Allah wala. But only Ibn Qasir has been translated into English by many other publishers, including Darul Salam from Riyadh. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. Just one little point on that. Which is earlier? The Tabri. Tabri. Yes, Tabri is earlier. Ibn Qasir, he died in 774 age after Hijri. He came about four and a half centuries after Tabri. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Is it compulsory to listen to the Quran attentively if we are sitting in a large gathering where the Quran is being recited? As far as the views are concerned amongst the scholars, there are two groups of scholars. One group of scholars says that it is fard. When the Quran is being recited, you have to listen to it attentively. And they quote the Quranic verse of Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 204, which says that when the Quran is recited, listen to it and be at peace so that mercy and blessing will be stored on you. So one group of scholars, the first group which say that is fard, they are again divide into two groups. One group says it is an individual fard. That means whenever the Quran is cited, every individual Muslim should listen to it attentively. While the other group says it is fard kifaya. That means if someone is listening to it, the others, it's not fard for them. Like, for example, they give that if someone wishes salam to a group of Muslims, even if one or two reply, then the others need not reply. My walikum salam. So similarly, in the first group, the second part of the scholars, they say that it is fard kifaya. The other group say that it is not fard to listen to the Quran when it's recited. It is mustab. And they say that this verse of the Quran, Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 204, which says that when the Quran is recited, listen to it attentively and be at peace so that mercy is bestowed on you. They say this verse was specifically revealed only for hearing the Quran during Salah. It's not a general commandment that whenever the Quran is recited, it's only during Salah. And this is the view even of Ibn Qasir, even Ibn Jarir. And the quote, they mention the Salaf al -Sali. They say that when two were talking, the third one says that the Quran is being recited. So listen to it. So they again continue talking. There's a storyteller and they're talking among themselves. Second time they're reminded that the Quran is recited, listen to it. Again, they don't pay heed and they again start talking. The third time when they said, they say, it's only in Salah. That means they knew this verse of the Quran was specifically revealed only for Salah. And the majority of the scholars, they believe in this view, that it's only in Salah that it's compulsory when the Quran is being recited, you have to listen to it attentively. And Ibn Jariri further goes on to say that it is when the Imam is reciting. So he says, besides the Salah, even when the Imam is giving the Qutbah, giving the Juma Qutbah, 
And when he recites the Quran, even that time it becomes compulsory after listen to that interview. And when one Sheikh was asked this question, that if there are a few people in the car, and if one person wants to listen to the Quran and puts on the tape of the recitation of the Quran, and the other people aren't interested, so is it fine that the other people are talking and one person is hearing the Quran? So he says that he agrees with the view of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, may Allah be pleased with him, who says that listening to the Quran is only compulsory during Salah. At other times, it's mustahab, it's encouraged. But he says that if someone is playing the recitation of the Quran in a car, and if some people are talking, then the person who wants to listen, it's preferable that he puts a headphone and listens to it. And the other people are talking and continue talking, because they should respect the Quran. Though it's not a fard to listen to the Quran if it's on the audio tape, but it's preferable. This is his suggestion. And further to ask that a woman, if she's cooking, and if she's cooking food in the kitchen, so can she play the Quran on the audio tape or on a CD and listen to it? Again, the view of most of the scholars, yes, she can. No, and because she can pay as much attention as possible, there's no problem. It's not compulsory, she has to give full attention. At least the Quran, she is hearing the Quran, it's going in her head, she may memorize a certain part of it. So if she's cooking and if she's hearing, there's no problem at all. It's not a fact that she should leave everything and listen to it. That's only a view of some of the scholars. But the majority of scholars agree that they need not leave everything of their work and listen to it attentively. It's preferable, it's mustah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Zakir. The next question is wudu compulsory before touching the Qur'an? Many Muslims consider that wudu is compulsory before touching the Qur'an or before reading the Qur'an. And this is the view of the majority of the Muslims. But the scholars are divided whether it's fard or not. There's a verse in the Qur'an in Surah Waqiyah, chapter 56, verse number 77 to 80, where it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Qur'an in a tablet well preserved. And none shall touch it except those are pure. So based on this verse of the Qur'an, many of the Muslims think it is fard that wudu should be there before touching the Qur'an. But if you read the nuzul quran and if you read the comment of Ibn Qasir, he says that this verse was revealed when people alleged that Prophet Muhammad he got the revelation from the Satan. So this verse actually says that none shall touch the Qur'an, it's talking about the Qur'an in Lohim Hafuz. It's not talking about the Musaf of the Qur'an. This copy of the Qur'an, anyone can purchase it for $4, $5, 100 rupees, 150 rupees, easily, and touch it. What is talking about? That none shall be able to touch that Qur'an in Lohim Mehfuz, except those who are mutahareen. So the Kitab in Maknoon is the book, the Lohim Mehfuz. And mutahareen doesn't only mean bodily cleanliness, person Shumni Vudu. It means a person who is not only clean in body, but even in mind and soul. A person who is sinless, referring to the angels, that the Satanists cannot come close to the Quran, they cannot touch it. It is only the angels who can do it. So this verse doesn't refer to the Musaf of the Quran. So if you know the Nuzul Quran, when it was revealed. So most of the scholars say that, based on this, the scholars who know the Nuzul Quran, they say that therefore wudu, from this verse you can't conclude that wudu is fard. But most of the scholars agree it is mustahab, it's encouraged. It's preferable that a person should be in wudu when he reads or touches the Quran. Thank you, doctor. Next question. Can a person give the Quran to a non-Muslim? Can a Muslim give the Quran to a non-Muslim? Many of the Muslims consider that being in wudu is compulsory before touching the Quran. That is the reason they say you can't give the Quran to the non-Muslim. I already told you earlier, it's not a fard. And furthermore, some Muslims say, okay, fine, if you want to give the Quran, don't give the Arabic version, only give the translation. Give only English or French or German. I said, fine, someone wants to do that, I've got no problem. But I prefer giving the translation along with the Arabic text. Because if the translator, who is a human being, has made a mistake, you can go back to the original text. The person should not misunderstand that Allah has made a mistake, no, I prefer Arabic along with the translation. 
And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me responsible for giving the Arabic Quran to a non-Muslim, I will be in the good company. I'll be in the company of the Prophet. Because our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he dictated letters to non-Muslim kings. He dictated letters to the Negus of Abyssinia, to Emperor Heraclius, Emperor of Persia, King of Yemen, King of Egypt. He dictated letters in which he even dictated the verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul yahil al-kitab, say, O people of the book, Ta'alu ila qalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term, Allah na'buda illallah, that we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi shayyam, that we associate to partner with him. Wala yatta khiza baad duna baad dan arbaban min dinillah, that we erect not among ourselves, lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa'in tawalla, if then they turn back. Fa'kulu shadu, say ibe witness, bi anna muslimoon, that we are muslims bowing over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this verse of the Quran was dictated by a prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he sent letters to the non-Muslim kings. Some of them, after reading the letter, they accepted Islam. Some of them tore the letter. Some of them even trampled it beneath the feet. So when the Prophet could give verse of the Quran to the non-Muslim, why can't we? And furthermore, I would like to ask the question that today, there are 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Which translation of the Quran will you give to these Arab Christians? Will you translate the Quran into Arabic? So the best is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I feel there's no problem. In fact, you should give the Quran along with the translation to non-Muslims. Thank you, doctor. Last question. What is the meaning of Alif, Lam, Meem? As far as the meaning of the words Alif, Lam, Meem, etc. is concerned, these words are known as mutakkakat. They are known as the broken letters. And they occur in several surahs of the Quran. Sometimes they occur in single, like Saad, in Surah Saad, chapter 38. As Qaf, Surah Qaf, chapter 50. As Noon, in Surah Kalam, chapter 68. Sometimes it occurs in twos, in pairs, like Taha, Surah Taha, chapter number 20. Taasin, in Surah Namal, chapter 27. As Yasin, Surah Yasin, chapter 36. Sometimes it occurs in combination of three. And the three combinations mentioned in the Quran. One occurs six times, five times, the other twice. It's 13 times that occurs in combination of three. One combination is Alif, Lam, Meem. It's then Surah Baqarah, chapter number two. Surah Imran, chapter number three and surah number 29, 30, 31, 32. It occurs in the combination of Alif, Lam, Ra, from Surah Yunus chapter number 10 to Surah Hijar chapter number 15, five times. It even occurs as Ta Sin, Meme, in Surah Shura chapter number 26, as well as Surah number 28. It occurs in the combination of four letters, Alif, Lam, Meme, raw and other combinations. It even occurs twice in combination of five. So in short, there are five combinations, single, double, three letter, four letter, five letter. Totally, there are 29 times that occurs in the Quran, equal to the Arabic letters, Alif, Ba, Ta, 29 times, counting even Hamza. There are various reasons that people have said why do these broken letters occur. Several reasons and many books have been written, volumes have written. Some say these are the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some say the abbreviation like noon is for noor, that is light. Some say they are signatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some say they are used for rhyming. Some say they have got numerical values. Some say they have been used for calling the attention, attracting the attention of the Prophet and Prophet used it for the other human beings. Various reasons, but the best amongst them I feel, is the view, which is also of Hazrat Abu Bakr, may Allah be with him. For example, we know what the body is made up of. Whatever components the body has, the same elements and components are present in the earth, in lesser or greater quantity. We know the constituents of the human being. We can buy it from the market. We can put water, but you can't give life. That is the secret. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses these letters and tells to the Arabs, 
the Arabs at that time, they were proud of the language. And Arabic was at its peak. So Allah says, Alif, Lam, Mim, Yasin, Qaf, Noon. These are your letters. With your letters, I've produced the Quran. He challenges them to produce somewhat similar to the Quran. And this challenge is given in several places. In Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 34, that produce a book like the Quran. Allah repeats the message in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 88. Allah says, produce a recital like the Quran. Then Allah makes the challenge a bit easier and says in Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 13, that Allah challenges that can you produce 10 surahs like the Quran? Allah further simplifies the challenge in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 38, that produce a single surah like the Quran. Allah makes it simplified further in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 23 and 24, where Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَاتُوْ بِسُورَةٍ مِّمْ مِسْلِي That if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then produce a surah somewhat similar to it. وَدْعُوا شُوَدَىٰ أَقُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And call forth your helpers and witnesses, if there are any besides Allah, if your doubts are but true. فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا But if you cannot do it, وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا And of surety you cannot do it. فَاتَّكُنْ نَارَ الَّتِي وَكُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْهِجَارَةَ وَإِذَّتِ الْكَافِرِينَ Then fear the fire whose fuel shall be men and stones, which is prepared for those who reject faith. So this is a challenge. Allah says to the Arabs who were proud of the language, this is your letter, Alif, Lam, Mim, A, B, C, D. From your letters, I've created the Quran. He challenges, try and produce a surah somewhat similar to the Quran. So this is the closest explanation that I feel is right. It's a challenge Allah is giving. And that is the reason, moment these broken letters are uh, mentioned in the Quran, immediately after that, there is some attribute of the Quran mentioned after that. So I feel this explanation, I feel, is the closest to the meanings of these broken letters, and Allah alam. So Dr. Zakir, thank you very much. Jazakallah wa khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you, doubled and multiplied, especially in this Amen. month of Ramadan. Brothers and sisters, I hope you've enjoyed and you've taken great benefit. Do continue to take benefit from all of our shows. Ramadan, the day with Dr. Zakia. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow when we will be discussing the topic, Zaka, part one. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صب وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورفق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي كل